private cemetery holding the remains of this country's great patriots should be considered as much a landmark as are certain buildings. A quote from the 1966 Landmarks Preservation Commission report on Lawrence Cemetery. Welcome to Buried Secrets, a podcast about the paranormal, the occult, and weird and forgotten history. I'm Chris. Hope everyone had a great week. This week, I'm excited to talk about another of Astoria's hidden cemeteries. This one is a rare family cemetery that has survived. So I mentioned a couple weeks ago that a number of family cemeteries have vanished. And this one is very much hidden, kind of tucked away, but has managed to hold on. So excited to get into that history. But before I talk about that, I wanted to talk about what I've been reading. So a couple weeks ago, I finished reading that book about Santa Muerte by Tomá Prower. The book is just called La Santa Muerte. And I wanted to make a quick correction. So last time I talked about this book, I said that it came out last summer. The audiobook came out last summer. The book itself, I think, came out in 2015. And when I talked about this book a couple weeks ago, I had just gotten through the first section or so that was talking about the history of Santa Muerte, which I had really enjoyed and thought was really interesting. One thing in particular that I learned was while Santa Muerte is often translated as Saint Death, apparently the more accurate translation would be Holy Death. So I thought that was interesting from that section. I do have much more mixed feelings about the rest of the book. I think that ultimately what I would have been looking for in a book about Santa Muerte and the practices and magic associated with a folk saint like her, I think what I really want is an oral history, like interviews with practitioners, going back decades, talking about how the practice has changed and evolved, etc. I realize my interest is probably more historical and more on kind of like comparing how different people see their relationship with death and Santa Muerte, etc. Whereas the rest of the book really felt like a lot of the books I've read about Wicca, while it pointed out the differences between Wiccan practices and magic related to Santa Muerte, a lot of it did still feel really reminiscent of Wicca to me. And of course, I don't know much at all about the magical practices associated with Santa Muerte. So I'm not trying to say that this book wasn't true to this author's experience, but it did feel like the author was talking about his practice rather than many different people's practice. Like I would have really loved interviews and that sort of thing. And that's just not what this book was. And I think also because my interest in Santa Muerte is more academic Of course, I would love to know more from an academic perspective, and I didn't really need like the chapters on herbal and color meanings and correspondences because I've read that in a bunch of other books about Wicca, and there was a lot of overlap. But maybe it is more valuable to someone who is more of a magic practitioner and really wants a view of the nuts and bolts of one specific practitioner's way of working with and venerating Santa Muerte. I still enjoyed the book, but my recommendation of it is a lot more tempered, I guess, than when I initially had just started reading the book. But still worth reading, I think, if you're interested in learning more. And if anybody does know a book that's more of like an oral history or interviews with folks who venerate Santa Muerte, please let me know. My Spanish is really, really bad, so ideally I'm looking for something in English. Though if you know something in Spanish too, I'm still interested. Still let me know. Write to me at buriedsecretspodcast at gmail.com. So, I don't know. A little bit of a mixed bag with that book, but I'm still glad I read it. And I'm actually reading a book on magic that I'm enjoying right now that I'll talk to you guys more about next week. So let's get into the topic of today's episode, Lawrence Cemetery here in Astoria, New York. So like the rest of the cemeteries I've been talking about in this series, this is a cemetery that I had no idea existed until the lockdown a year ago. 
And I got a little stir crazy and started researching all these hidden cemeteries. And then that's how I found out about this cemetery that's tucked away in Northern Astoria. So it's a family cemetery. So who are the Lawrences who are buried there? The Lawrences were an old Astoria family. They were English and they came to America in the 1600s and they ended up in Flushing, which is a neighborhood further out in Queens in 1644. They bought land all over Queens, including some land in Astoria in 1656. I found their family crest in a 1852 book called The Annals of Newtown in Queens County, New York. It's not the world's most interesting family crest. It is a shield with a cross thing in the middle that has like jagged lines. And then above that, there's something that looks like an overturned cup. And then there's a scroll with Quero Invenio, which Google Translate says means I find. That's the Lawrence family crest. As I've talked about the last couple of weeks, many historic family cemeteries no longer exist. Typically the remains are removed and then stuff is built on top of the land. As I've mentioned before, New York City has basically been run by developers for a very long time and a ton of history has been destroyed in the name of profit. And here in Astoria, especially along the coastlines, it's not just developers who have leveled cemeteries. It's also companies that are building power plants. So I'll get to that later. Interestingly, there are actually two Lawrence family cemeteries left in Queens, right? Most family burial grounds didn't even survive. And two of the Lawrence cemeteries survived, which is really notable to me. I don't know if that speaks to their wealth or their influence, or if it's just plain luck. The other cemetery is in Bayside, which is in Northern Queens, which is pretty far away from mass transit. So I've never been there. Also, I haven't taken mass transit since COVID started. And of course the other cemetery is right here in Astoria. So last spring I ran up to Lawrence Cemetery which is in Northern Astoria, right near the big Con Edison power plant and near a big wastewater treatment plant. If you look at a map of Northern Astoria, you'll see that there's this bit of land that juts out a bit, kind of between the Hellgate and Rikers Island and just north of Astoria Park. That's where the Con Edison plant is. And that is notable because even on Google Maps nowadays, it's called Lawrence Point. So. It's an area that's totally inaccessible to anyone who doesn't work there. It's a big amount of land that's cordoned off, but it still has this history of being associated with the Lawrences, which is kind of interesting. There actually used to be a family cemetery where the Con Ed plant is now, according to Carolee Inskeep's The Graveyard Shift, a family historian's guide to New York City cemeteries. At 20th Avenue and 21st Street in Astoria, the Barry and Remsen Family Burial Ground, a private cemetery with gravestones dating from the 18th century to 1810, once stood. I wanted to read this little bit from her book. This burial ground was at the north end of Barian's Lane, facing Barian's Creek and Barian's Island. It was obliterated in 1902 for construction of a gas manufacturing plant. Con Edison now occupies the site. As you can probably guess, the Berrien family was another old family in Astoria, and Berrien Lane, Berrien's Creek, and Berrien's Island are all gone now. Landfill united Berrien's Island with the mainland of Queens, and that area is now part of that area of land that is occupied by the Con Ed plant. And also, I realize I've been saying Con Ed and Con Edison, they're a power company, they're also a gas company, so they power, I think, all of New York City. I've always had to pay them for my power. And then also they provide gas through some of New York City. So the week before last, I talked about the Ravenswood Generating Station, which stands where the Blackwell Family Cemetery once was, and which is a major polluter that causes a lot of health problems for local residents. I have a friend who used to live up near the Con Ed plant in Northern Astoria, and they said that they had a lot of respiratory issues because of that plant. And the issue of these power plants causing health problems in this neighborhood is a pretty big deal. 
we actually just got a piece of mail from our state assembly representative that was talking about how less than a mile away from where we live, the NRG is trying to build a power plant that runs on fracked natural gas, which could also contribute even more to asthma and respiratory problems in the area. So it's not good. And there's also some kind of weird irony embedded here, right? These cemeteries have been obliterated to build factories that are making everyone sick, right? Like power plants. So anyway, I don't know Northern Astoria that well. That area is also called Dittmars, or sometimes it's called Steinway, because it used to be basically a company town for the old Steinway piano company. Well, I guess it still exists. The Steinway factory is still up there, I'm pretty sure. But it's less of a company town. Originally, they had moved the Steinway factory here to get away from union organizing in Manhattan. And Astoria was so far removed from the labor movement in the city that it was an ideal location, I guess. But anyway, I don't know that area very well, in part because there's not a lot of parkland up there. There's not a ton of things you would go up there to see aside from Astoria Park, which is on the western coast, which is where I spend a lot of time, western coast of Queens. And then there's a lot of great restaurants and that sort of thing. But the whole northern shore of Astoria, pretty much, is completely inaccessible to the public. There's the power plant, there's the wastewater treatment plant, there's LaGuardia Airport, and then there's Rikers Island. So regular citizens, normal people, don't really have access to the northern shoreline of Astoria. The whole area is blocked off and it feels kind of dystopian and weird. And the only real reason I've had to go up near Astoria's northern shore in the many years I've lived in Astoria was to see the Lawrence Cemetery last year. The only other time I'd really been up near there was looking at apartments back in 2012 when I was considering moving to that part of Astoria. And I mentioned Rikers Island, so I just want to pause and talk about that a little bit. I talk about Rikers in more detail in one of the Renwick Smallpox Hospital episodes, but obviously not everyone's listened to that, so I just wanted to go into a little bit more detail here. So Rikers is a jail... It's an infamous, very bad jail. 85% of the people who are in prison there are waiting for trial. So they aren't people who've been convicted of any kind of crime. They're just waiting for their day in court. It's an infamously unsafe place to be imprisoned, especially during COVID. And I don't want to get too off topic here, but if you do want to help people make bail and get out of there, you can donate to the Emergency Release Fund at emergencyreleasefund.com, which is focused on getting high-risk inmates out of Rikers, like queer and trans people, because of course it's even less safe for queer and trans people. And if you're listening to this, you probably agree that it is a horrible human rights abuse to put people who haven't even been convicted of a crime in jail for years, often just because they can't afford bail, So in effect, it can end up just housing people who are too poor to post bail and imprisoning them for the crime of being poor. But if that isn't a convincing argument for you and you're more concerned with money, for some reason that I don't understand, it costs the city of New York $209,000 per year to imprison people in Rikers, which doesn't make any sense to me. But While prisoners at Rikers are used for slave labor, like doing things like burying indigent people in New York City's Potter's Field, Heart Island, I think it's pretty obvious that that slave labor doesn't offset the cost of imprisoning people in this jail. So for these and many other reasons, in New York City, the idea of closing Rikers is a very popular one. And the current city council member who represents my district proposed legislation called the Renewable Rikers Act, which will close Rikers Island as a prison and instead use the land to generate power through renewable energy. So that legislation was signed into law a couple of weeks ago, which is really great news for all of New York City 
And my current city council representative has been term limited, but there's a really great candidate named Tiffany Caban, who actually just, I guess last week, I was out collecting signatures for because she's really great, has awesome policies, and I think would do a lot of good things for the neighborhood. And, you know, she supports closing Rikers Island and she supports the Renewable Rikers Act. And I'm mentioning this in case anyone listening here lives in the neighborhood in Astoria. If you live here, please vote for Tiffany Caban on June 22nd. You can learn more about her at cabanforqueens.com. I know this might seem like a tangent, right? Why am I talking about a local city council race in an episode about hidden cemeteries? It's because history isn't over, and power, both literal and figurative, here in Astoria, is really relevant when looking at history. But in particular, the history of family cemeteries around here. I mean, multiple family cemeteries around here have literally been demolished to build power plants that are making people sick today. Landfill has made islands like Berrien's Island vanish, and Rikers Island, for example, has been made four times bigger than it originally was, just so it could hold some more prisoners. Homes have been obliterated, the shapes of islands have been changed, and it's only when you start to look at the historical maps of the neighborhood and seeing what it looked like a couple hundred years ago that you really realize all the things that have been buried, destroyed, and forgotten. And it's really easy to think that history is over or that it's all in the past, but it is all happening now still. So to get back to Lawrence Cemetery, Lawrence Cemetery is a piece of history that's still standing. It's more than 300 years old. It was founded in 1656, though it was officially founded and I think recognized as a cemetery by the city maybe, or by local government. In 1703, according to an inscription in stone beside its gate, it was landmarked in 1966, and Oliver Lawrence was the last person who was buried there in 1975. So that's a long history, people from this family being buried there from 1656 to 1975. So this is a privately owned cemetery. It's not really open to the public. I know occasionally there are private tours and stuff, but in general, you kind of just have to peer in through the gate. The current owner slash caretaker of the cemetery is James N. Sheehan, whose wife inherited the cemetery and the house next door, which is where they live. And Sheehan's father-in-law had inherited the cemetery and the house from Ruth Lawrence, who was one of the last surviving Lawrences. I guess she cut out Oliver Lawrence, the last person buried in the cemetery, out of her will. They had some sort of falling out. I think he was her nephew. So that's how she and his father-in-law ended up with the cemetery. And Sheehan is 84, and he has been the cemetery's caretaker since 1956. Records say that 94 people are buried in the cemetery, though Sheehan says it's actually much more than that. And I wanted to read a bit from a Queen's Chronicle article from October 5th, 2000 about this cemetery. The Lawrences were important folk, many playing key roles in local history. They intermarried with the Rikers of Rikers Island. They are related to Captain James Lawrence, the naval officer whose words, don't give up the ship during the War of 1812, have become immortalized. James Lawrence was buried in Trinity Church in Manhattan as an honor, but the rest of his family is buried in Sheehan's backyard. The graveyard holds the remains of lieutenant governors, New York City mayoral candidates, revolutionary and Civil War heroes, and other notables with rich histories. There's another Lawrence Cemetery in Bayside where the family eventually expanded their burials. That graveyard started in the 1800s and is now tended by the Bayside Historical Society. So this cemetery stands on an ordinary street corner. It is elevated up on a stone wall and behind both a chain link fence that has barbed wire on top, which separates it from the street. And then on the other side of the chain link fence, there is a more picturesque stone and iron fence. Inside are three centuries worth of Lawrence family burials, including Sarah Lawrence, who the university was named after. The Lawrences, of course, you know, 
were an old family, and supposedly they descended from one of King Richard the Lionheart's crusaders in England. And I read somewhere that there actually used to be three Lawrence family cemeteries, including one that was a few blocks away from this one, which has been destroyed, probably for the power plant or the wastewater treatment plant. However, I didn't see mention of that third cemetery when I checked the book, The Graveyard Shift, which is my trusty companion in all things New York City cemeteries. It really specializes in family cemeteries that have disappeared because the book is designed for people to research their genealogy and figure out, you know, if their ancestors were buried one place, figure out where they might have been moved. So I thought it was a little unusual that some places said there was a third cemetery, but her book didn't have it. Though, of course, no book is completely infallible. I did want to read a bit of the cemetery's history from the graveyard shift, which calls the cemetery the Lawrence Manor Burial Ground. So to read from that. In 1915, the cemetery was restored after some years of neglect. Its stone fence and wrought iron gate were repaired, and the grounds were planted with flowers. There were plans to purchase the surrounding property and convert it into a park as a historic site for future generations. That would have been really cool and nice. It is a beautiful cemetery. It would have been nice for there to be a pretty little park up there. In a 1932 report called Description of Private and Family Cemeteries in the Borough of Queens, it describes the wall of the cemetery. So the part of the wall that has the front gate, which faces 20th Road, formerly called Bowery Bay Road, is, quote, a dressed stone wall with an iron rail fence. And then the part facing 35th Street is a, quote, brick wall topped with iron rail fence. The 1932 report also has a list of all the inscriptions in the cemetery, and in addition to the Lawrences, there are some other familiar names from old families in the area that I recognized. So, for example, one person buried there was Abraham Riker Lawrence. I'll talk more about the Riker family next time. There's also a Ruth Lawrence, who was the daughter of Andrew and Jane Riker. There is Agnes Rappelli. I can't say that name, R-A-P-E-L-Y-E. But the week before last, I talked about Cornelius Rappelier. It bothers me so much that I can't say that name. Cornelius Trafford. (laughs) Let's just skip the part of his name I can't say. But Trafford was the man with two graves. He might be buried here in Astoria in the churchyard of Church of the Redeemer, or he might be buried in Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn. I have not been able to confirm either, but they must have been related. There's also some members of the Soydam family. I'm not totally sure that I'm pronouncing that right, but it's S-U-Y-D-A-M. You might recognize that name because Trafford's Greenwood Cemetery grave is beside one of the Soydams. It's a little tiny family plot there. There's also an Amy Lawrence, who was the daughter of Cornelius and Amy Berrien, of the nearby Berrien family, who I was talking about earlier. I liked the inscription on her tombstone, which was, this life is a dream and an empty show. Into the wide world we must go. I thought that was nice. Another inscription that I like appears on Judith Lawrence's marble tombstone. There's a skull and crossbones with the words, to this must all flesh come, which I found very metal and very cool. There's a great Huffington Post article about the cemetery from 2011, and it had some quotes from Sheehan I just had to read. It's heavenly living next to the cemetery. I consider the people there my neighbors, and I want to keep them looking good. Another quote is, I take pride in doing this. People always ask me if it's scary. It's not. It's very tranquil here. I love to turn on the radio and sit up here in the evenings. But there are those scary moments. You feel something tugging at your shoulder, and you turn around and discover it's the rose bush. Also, the article mentions how apparently his daughters used to hold seances in the cemetery, though it didn't go into any detail. I love that. (laughs) How fun would it be to happen to grow up next to a cemetery that you got to play in as part of your backyard and you could just hold seances there? Very cool. When I visited the cemetery, I wasn't able to get that many pictures of it because So it's on a street corner, and there's the two fences. And then the street corner 
had cars parked all around it. So I had to kind of climb behind some cars to try to get a good angle of the gates and stones inside. But as I was crouched behind a car, Sheehan and I think maybe his wife came out of their house because they live just next door and came out to go into the cemetery. And they looked at me kind of suspiciously. I can't imagine why. So I ran away. I felt a little bad because I was in my running clothes, but I also had like a face mask covering basically my whole face. I had a hat and sunglasses on. So I probably looked very creepy just popping out of the woodwork there next to their cemetery. So hopefully I didn't give them too much of a scare. They're probably used to people coming up and trying to see into the cemetery, but it was a really cool sight. And someday I would love to go on a tour there. I would love to see what it looks like on the inside. The website GiveMeAStoria.com ran an article about Lawrence Cemetery in October 2020, and I wanted to close with a quote from that that looks ahead to the future of the cemetery. So to read from that, The thing that worries me most is what will happen to this place after I am gone, said Sheehan. Sheehan has been tending to the site for nearly 60 years, paying for repairs out of his own pocket but he is worried about what will become of the place in the future. I've been maintaining this out of respect for my father-in-law in the history of the Lawrences, Mr. Sheehan said. The Queen's Historical Society will be working with the City Council and Community Board 1 to assist Sheehan in helping to preserve the property for future generations. So one thing I just realized while reading that quote is that's another way that the City Council literally ties into the history of the area and the preservation of these sites, right? People will have a tendency to overlook local government, but it actually is very important. And it's kind of funny, you know, last week I talked a lot about our current city council representative, and I didn't think that local politics were going to come up so much in my research about these local cemeteries and the areas that they're in. But like I said, there's not really a difference between the past and the present and history and now. It's all part of the same thing. It's all connected. And as soon as you start looking at one thing, you're suddenly looking at the other. So that's Lawrence Cemetery. And the cemetery I want to talk about next week is right sort of in the same area in northern Astoria, a little closer to LaGuardia Airport. So more on this other hidden cemetery next week. And I'm also hoping that I'll get a chance to visit the cemetery I want to talk about next week because it is a little further away than from where I live. And so I haven't been there yet. So that's on my list this weekend as well. Hopefully I'll make it. And the cemetery I want to talk about next week is also in an elderly person's yard. So hopefully I won't scare anybody looking in the gate this time too. So if you want to check out any of the sources I mentioned today, you can check out the show notes at buriedsecretspodcast.com. You can email me at buriedsecretspodcast at gmail.com. You can follow the show on Instagram at buriedsecretspodcast. I've been posting a lot of pictures of the different cemeteries and things I've been talking about, as well as other topics I covered on the show. And if you enjoyed this, please tell your friends about it. Please rate and review. And thanks so much for listening.